to take a quick review of our verse and then dive right back into the doctrine of redemption. But before we begin our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish this out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to have our freedom and be able to come together as Christians without persecution. We're praying you go forward with us this evening in your word, make it a source of encouragement and also challenge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My New King James Version is not bad. First Timothy Chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Who gave himself, that is Jesus Christ, as a ransom, that means a payment, to free the slaves for all to be testified in due time or in God the Father's dispensation as he arranged his plan. I'm going to go right back to our doctrine. I'm just going to flick through where we made it so far, not do a full review, but on the doctrine of redemption, first of all, we looked at the etymology of the Greek and saw all of the derivatives. Secondly, we looked at a definition and we saw that redemption is the work of Christ on the cross directed towards sin. Thirdly, we looked at the point that Jesus Christ is the only qualified redeemer. And I think one verse that is not there, and I don't have the number for it, but you remember the story. Jesus asked his disciples a rhetorical question. Are you able to be baptized with the cup that I am about to be baptized with? And they said, yes, we are able but they were not qualified because they had human fathers and they had old sin nature intact in every cell of their human body and therefore they were not qualified. Only Jesus Christ is qualified having God the Holy Spirit to supply the 23 chromosomes to fertilize that one cell in Mary's body that was pure he became the only qualified redeemer. And remember, it takes a free man to buy slaves. A slave can't buy slaves. Jesus Christ is the only free man born into the human race. Point four, Christ was willing, and that means he used his volition, went to the cross, and died a spiritual death. It means he didn't have to, he chose to. If you look at Acts 2.23, and you've ever listened to any tapes from the colonel, <clears throat> you'll know that is the conference he taught. It was called the Eternal Life Conference. And it is where the Trinity accepted their job titles in God the Father's plan. God the Holy Spirit as the revealer and the restorer. God the Father as the blueprinter of the ages and planner. And Jesus Christ, the creator and the Savior. It 
So we saw point five, the doctrine of redemption was taught in the Old Testament by means of animal blood from animal sacrifices. And we took, we talked about the fact that the priest uh, would cut the carotid artery of the animal there by the altar and the animal would uh, lose its blood and lose consciousness and eventually die. Now, I, I knew this even as a child growing up, but I never put the two together. I always heard Christ died for you. But the fact is, is that Christ had already paid the sin debt when he died physically. It was the three-hour period of time in which he died a spiritual death that he purchased mankind from the slave market of sin. And this is, the analogy goes all the way back to the Old Testament. For if Christ would have died physically to purchase us from the slave market of sin, the priest would have caught the animal behind the ear and knocked him out and killed him instantly. But instead, the period of time in which the heart pumped the blood out represented the period of time in which Christ was separated from God the Father and imputed with the sins of the world and had them judged in his body on the wood. And therefore, the blood sacrifice of the Old Testament was analogous to the spiritual death of Christ on the cross. And so you, when you see in the New Testament the blood of Christ, it is speaking of the three-hour period of time where Jesus Christ died a spiritual death. Point six, the blood of Christ is the ransom money or the purchase price of redemption. It's called the coin of the realm. We looked at scripture and it says, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. The only thing lacking for us is what do we think of Christ? Will you walk out? Now, I think, um, was that a new point, number six? Did we have that last week? I think. We had five, I know. This six may be a new one. We're going to see uh, this come back up, so I'm going to move on to point seven. This is the new one. Point seven, under the doctrine of redemption. It is the soul of the believer which is redeemed in salvation. There is a doctrine of the redemption of the body. It has to do with resurrection. And you'll remember in Ephesians 4.30, which we just studied, the day of redemption, as speaking of the body, the resurrection of church-age believers, also known as the rapture. Psalms 34.22 the Lord, that is Jesus Christ, redeemeth the soul of his servants. That's phase one. And none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. That's phase two. I like it. There's, there's lots of lonely people in the world. There's lots of people that feel isolated. There's, you know, there's a big mental problem among young people that says, nobody knows what I'm going through.
And if they had any doctrine in their souls, they'd recognize that God knows how many hairs they have on their head. And he cares for even the birds, and he knows when even one sparrow falls from the sky. How much more does he care for them? Except they reject doctrine, and they don't know doctrine, and therefore they're not comforted. And they feel alone in the world, and they're alone and miserable, and they're whiny, and they say, no one knows my misery. See, if you only had a friend in Jesus Christ, you'd never be lonely. And if you only had some doctrine in your soul, you'd never be bored. You'd always have something to reflect upon. See, it's doctrine that gets you through. Not, not uh, friends, so-called friends. And the Lord is the one that'll never forsake you, no matter where you're at. Them that trust in him shall never be desolate. Point number eight. <clears throat> Redemption removes the condemnation of the Mosaic law. I've got Galatians 3 verses 10 and verse 13 on the board for you. Galatians 3.10 reads like this. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth, not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And that didn't mean just Ten Commandments. That meant 613 of them. And uh, remember the rich young ruler? that came to Jesus and said, Lord, Lord, I've, I've done all of this and uh, I've kept uh, Moses' law. What should I do next? And Jesus says, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. In other words, come learn some doctrine. Forsake everything and come learn doctrine. Get you a crash course, son. It's the only thing that's going to blast the uh, religion out of you. And he went, he went away sad. He couldn't do it. And see, when it says in the law, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. That's what it's saying, love doctrine. For doctrine is the mind of Christ. Doctrine is the Lord's thinking. And the rich young ruler just couldn't do it. Just couldn't turn away. So Galatians 3.13 says this. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Why, how did he become a curse? Because he was made sin for us. Sin was judged in his body on the tree. And it goes on and says, For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So, we are condemned by the law. There's no man that can keep the whole thing. Jesus Christ is the only man who ever lived who kept the whole thing. And uh, even Paul, who was completely moral, said there was one that slew him. Covetousness. Said it got him. Point nine then, we're going to see several results from redemption. And A is the one we just looked at. We have deliverance from the curse of the law. It's a curse because no man can do it. We all failed at some point or another. It 
So we've been delivered from the curse of the law. Secondly, the cancellation or forgiveness of sins. And I put a couple of these verses here in front of you. I like Isaiah 44, 22 because it's called the big blot out. And uh, at the moment of salvation, God not only forgives sin, but he erases or takes away all the scar tissue of the soul, which happened in unbelief. So in Isaiah 44, 22, Isaiah is speaking from the Lord. He says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. In other words, your transgressions were thick as a cloud. And as a cloud thy sins return to me, for I have redeemed thee. In Hebrews 9.15, the writer says, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant or new testament. That by means of spiritual death. For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. In other words, the Mosaic law revealed our sins. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So thank God he's forgiven our sins and we had the big blot out the moment we were saved. Um, I always have questions because there's a couple of issues with blot out in the Bible. The Bible says that your name was in the book of life from eternity past. And um, those who believe in Christ will never have their name blotted out of the book of life. And I think about these wild names you see these kids having at school. You know, uh, it, it it's amazing. I don't even want to start saying some of them because I'll get you to laughing. But when God was recording all of these names into the book of life, do you think he is, maybe he could say, like, I've got to change history somehow. So Ferrari, Porsche, Lincoln is not going to live in 1996. And uh, whatever that name was. Or maybe it's another name that God gave you that we don't know yet. I don't know. But he says that your name will never be blotted out if you believe in Christ. The trouble is, when you die physically as a member of the human race, your volition stops at that moment. God says, put down the pencil. And if you go through this life in rejection of Jesus Christ, at the moment of your physical death, guess what happens? Your name is blotted out of the book of life. And at the great white throne judgment, they pull up the books, it says. And whoever's name was not found in the book of life, what? Was cast into the lake of fire. So, you get to choose salvation through Jesus Christ and having your sins blotted out. Redemption. Rejection of Jesus Christ and having your name blotted out. One or the other. One or the other. The free gift of salvation with the forgiveness of sins and eternal life or your name blotted out of the book of life and eternity in the lake of fire. One or the other for you. Point C, we're looking at the results of redemption. Redemption is the basis for justification. Romans 3.24 
reads like this, being justified freely by his grace. That's his grace policy. Through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Romans 3, 26 and 27 are some of my, one of my two, two of my favorite verses because it absolutely slays legalism. And um, they, always, they always say, yeah, I know you need to believe, but you also need to do this. There's a law there. And uh, it's the law of faith alone and Christ alone. And you can't add works to it, otherwise it neutralizes faith. And therefore... You see that grace is God's policy. We can't, earn, we can't work for salvation and we don't deserve it. It is freely given. So, point D, the results of redemption. Redemption is the basis for sanctification also. I didn't know we were going to get marriage verses tonight when we studied the doctrine of redemption, but we sure did. It's, uh, we're reading Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. It's actually talking about the church and how Jesus Christ redeemed the church. Paul says here, Husband, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That means when you get ready to love your woman, it's going to be sacrificial at times. And Christ sacrificed for the church, men sacrifice for their families, sometimes especially for their wives. What was the effect of his sacrifice? That he might sanctify or set apart and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. In other words, you're the bride, the church, you've been sanctified. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That means you've got a resurrection body and you've also been cleansed of your human good at Bema. But that it should be holy or set apart and without blemish. So Christ redeemed the church on the cross and sanctified her, set her apart. Point E, redemption is the basis for eternal inheritance. Hebrews 9.15 Very close to what our verse says. And for this cause he is the mediator of the new covenant that by means of his spiritual death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, the Mosaic law. They which are called, that means you received the divine call, that's God the Holy Spirit calling you to salvation, might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Peter says you have an inheritance stored for you in heaven, undefiled, where no man can touch it. By the way, the Bible of Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen. And you know what that means? That means that many will hear God the Holy Spirit call them to salvation. In other words, believe in Christ and thou shalt be saved. Many will hear the call, but few are chosen. That means few will accept 
the divine call for salvation. In other words, they'll hear the gospel message. It'll come through with clarity because God the Holy Spirit stands in place of the lacking human spirit of the unbeliever, makes the gospel perspicuous. They'll hear it. They'll understand it. They understand the message, but they don't believe. And they go on about life. And it's like the birds come by and get the seed off the wayside, off the hard path, and carry it away. So, believers are the ones who are chosen. Point F, results of redemption. Redemption is the basis for the strategic victory of Christ in the angelic conflict. I looked for this verse and looked for it last week, and I could not find it. And you know what I had to do? I had to read in the, in the King James Version before I could find it. And I said, there it is. I didn't know, and my, they changed it somehow in my new King James. In Colossians 2.14, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. And do you know what that is? That is a gambler's term that means that you owe God. What if you had a big gambling debt and you owed the mafia? And you're overdue. You'd be looking for those guys that come break your legs. Wouldn't you? Well, look, we owe God. What did we owe him, you say? We owed him perfect righteousness. Plus R. All we had was minus R. All of your righteousnesses are like filthy rags in my sight. That's what he had. We had to give him. We owed. We owed a debt we could not pay. Who would come along and save us from our debt? That is Christ. It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it, the IOU to his cross. having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. We know this is the triumphal procession. Part A has happened already where Jesus Christ emptied paradise and led them into the third heaven. The culmination of three Ambrose will happen at the second advent. You'll be there. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through spiritual death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to the slave market of sin or bondage, the fear of death. You see, Jesus Christ answers the problem of death. What say you, Martha? Who am I? You are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says before that, He who believes in me shall never die. Point G. Redemption of the soul and salvation leads to the redemption of the body in resurrection. Although they're two different subjects, you cannot have one without the other. Ephesians 1.14 says, which is the earnest, that's God the Holy Spirit taking up residence inside our human spirit as a down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. You've been purchased out of the slave market of sin. 
unto the praise of his glory. In other words, God will be glorified. Results of redemption, point eight. H, excuse me. Redemption of the body is phase three status of the royal family. So we're studying the doctrine of redemption, and there is redemption of the soul, but there's also redemption of the body, and this is what these verses speak of, Romans 8, 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. That means the down payment. Even ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Isn't it amazing that some people are going to have a drastic contrast on the day of redemption? where this mortal body takes on immortality. And all those aches and pains you've been putting up with for years that you've almost just learned to deal with are going to go away instantly. And then our verse that we just studied, Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Point 10, so we, we looked at all the results of redemption. We covered those. And now we bring in our own verse, which we're studying now. First Timothy, that's supposed to say 2, 5, and 6. And also Hebrews 9, 14, and 15. Hebrews reads like this, How much more shall the blood of Christ remember his substitutionary spiritual death on the cross lasting three hours? Who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, that means impeccability, to God the Father. Purge your conscience from dead works. That means they were returning to temple worship and it was certainly dead works. All of the uh, temple worship or tabernacle worship was a shadow Christology or a shadow soteriology. It was looking forward to things to come. But after the cross, we had the real thing, the historical example, and we no longer needed shadow worship. And he is saying, look, the new covenant has come in the blood of Christ. No longer are we going back to temple worship. All of that was shadow worship. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant, that by means of spiritual death for the redemption of, of the transgressions that were under the first covenant. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Jesus Christ redeemed us through his blood on the cross. Well, I think the last thing to do is diagram it. So every member of the human race having a human father was born into the slave market of sin. The Bible calls it <clears throat> our position in Adam. For as in Adam all die a spiritual death. And you were born 
into the position of Ab. But we came to the God, point of God consciousness and we heard about how Christ died for us. And then we saw right here the sheepfold. It is the door of faith. And we found that Christ had unlocked the door and he's calling us out like a good shepherd. I always think of my dad calling the hogs. And maybe you're a little better than the hogs, but maybe you're not. I sure do remember. Oh, that just brought up a memory. Wow. Um, the door of the sheepfold is faith alone in Christ alone. And many will come and they will try to steal the sheep over the wall. Those are the false teachers. Faith plus works. It doesn't work. So Christ says, those who believe in me shall never perish. So at the moment of salvation, God the Holy Spirit takes you out of Adam and places you into Christ. And though Christ has redeemed the whole world, you have to use your own volition to believe in Christ to be released from the slave market of sin. Faith alone and Christ alone. Now here's what's beautiful. At the very same moment you were born again, you also received a spiritual life. And this is your spiritual life, and this is your, uh, what we call fellowship with God, and this is your relationship here, and this is your fellowship here. And your relationship is eternal and your fellowship is temporary. But as newly born again Christians, we have the bottom circle. And if you will, it's our very own palace, our castle. And every believer in the church age is a royal priest and a royal ambassador. And we have the full privileges of royalty. Now what's hard for some is the fact that they were once a slave. And now they're royalty. And they don't know how to behave like royalty. For they were born into slavery. So the bottom circle represents the palace where every believer can dwell, but there's also a moat, and that's called carnality. Now remember that every believer is royalty, and they function with class and distinction. Class having the answers for life through Bible doctrine. Distinction. We are uh, in this world, but we're not of this world. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. We're sojourners in this life. And so we see that even though you may have been released from the slave market of sin, and now you have eternal salvation, as a believer, you may not know how to function as royalty. So as those who are redeemed, as those who are freed from the chains, as those who are slaves who have been set free, we ought to think and act and speak like the royalty we are, not as the slaves we once were, slaves to sin. And so there is diagram, the slave market of sin, Christ breaking down the barrier and paying the debt and releasing the slaves, although you have to believe to be set free. 
Uh, that concludes the doctrine of redemption, and I think I'll close her down right there. We'll move on next week to uh, verses 7, probably cover it at one time, and move on in First Timothy. Okay, I want to thank you for your attention and attendance this evening, and I want to pray with you, and then we'll shut her down. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for sending us a perfect Savior, the only one who was qualified to go to the cross and purchase us from the slave market of sin, and that is Jesus Christ. We're cer certainly thankful for the salvation that we didn't earn or deserve, but you so graciously have given us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.